All right, so again, hello and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Pierre and I am the training coordinator for the, the Child Brain Network. Uh, welcome to our session today, which is uh, one of our learning series webinar sessions that you know, continues tackling some uh, various topics within the realm of patient-oriented research and, and patient engagement uh, within the, the research process. Uh, today, our guest speakers will explore how trauma-informed practice can be implied within the context of medical research. Uh, before we get started, I just want to remind you to please disable your webcams and mute your microphones uh, to ensure a smoother session, uh, you know, to maximize our bandwidth capacity and limit any uh, potential unwanted background noise. Uh, during the webinar, there will, of course, there will be opportunities to interact with each other as well as the, the one of the facilitators we have today. So we certainly invite your input uh, via the chat feature or unmuting your microphone uh, at that time. So today uh, we are we are pleased to welcome Nicole Ward, Ward and Krista Andrews to our session. Nicole is a registered social worker in Calgary, and Nicole has been in frontline social work roles for the last fifteen years, and is currently working on a multidisciplinary team focused on the safety of children. And Nicole holds a Bachelor of Arts and a Bachelor of Social Work, and is currently in her final semester at the University of Calgary, where she will obtain a, a Master of Clinical Social Work with a focus on trauma informed practice. Uh, secondly, we have Krista, uh, who is a registered social worker who has dedicated much of her career to the area of child protection and believes that this comes with the responsibility to constantly consider opportunities for decolonization. Krista holds a Bachelor of Social Work from the University of Calgary and will convocate this spring with a Master of Clinical Social Work uh, with a specialization in trauma-informed practice. Uh, so, Chris, I believe you wanted to do a land acknowledgement. Chris, so we can see the presenter screen. You're muted. Sorry about that. I was having trouble unmuting. <laughs> okay. Do I have the right screen up now, Nicole? You. Nope. You are good to go. Yeah, okay, awesome. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, in the spirit of reconciliation, Nicole and I would like to acknowledge that we live, work, and play in Mokinstis, which is the Blackfoot name for Calgary. It's an area that's situated where the Bow River meets the Elbow River. And this is Treaty 7 land in the traditional territory of the Blackfoot Confederacy, which is made up of Siksika, Kainai, and Pakani as well as the Satena First Nation, the Stony Nakoda First Nation, and it's also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. As we are all treaty people, we also honor that many of you come from other treaty areas, and we invite you to reflect on the relationship that each of you have with the land on which you reside. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Nicole. Good morning. Um... I think uh, Chris, Krista and I, our biggest worry with this, <clears throat> excuse me, presentation was um, coming across as judgmental or critical or as if we were, um, you know, somehow like we thought we were experts in this field, but, but um, we are both also in social work positions and we work within a very large system and our clients are usually mandated. We strive to integrate trauma-informed practice in everything we do. However, we are often met with similar, similar challenges that you are likely met with with your patients. This no doubt impacts our ability to integrate trauma-informed practice at times. So we come here without judgment and an understanding that just like our clients, we all face barriers with implementation of trauma-informed practice. Our goal is to bring some ideas and examples and lighten the load from the perspective of two parents who, under, who have some understanding of trauma-informed practice and who also have the experience of having children who have been subjects of research. 
um, <clears throat> excuse me, we will use the words uh, trauma informed practice and trauma informed care interchangeably in this presentation. Um, so we'll cover today what trauma is and um, why trauma informed care matters and what trauma informed care is. Some trauma informed considerations. We'll do a case study together and we'll talk about trauma exposure in healthcare professionals. All right, oh, Chris. Have... Oh, sorry, go ahead, Chris. I hope Pierre's just going to do a little word cloud question with us. So uh, to the audience, you should have a direct link in the chat box. So if you want to click on, on that link, it'll open up a, a page where you can drop some input. Uh, and, and the question you are considering is when you think about trauma-informed care, what is one word or short phrase that comes uh, to mind? Um, now we do have, there's many, many uh, entries in there. So feel free to relay as, as many thoughts as you, uh, as you feel necessary. And um, make sure you scroll down all the way and, and click submit. Um, and then we should have a word cloud pop up here in just a few moments. Oh, sorry, I did not send the link to everyone. I apologize. Here you go. Oh, so you should have the link now. If not, do let us know in the chat. All right, so we'll give it another 15 seconds. Okay, we have some great words up there. Best practice, I see trust, be careful, generational trauma, collaboration. Somebody said that it's hard and it does get easier. All right, so I think we, we've received all, all the input um, uh, that, that the audience had checked. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, so I, with that, I'll hand it over to you, uh, Nicole and, and Krista. Hmm. Sorry, I had trouble navigating too. Um, so there's a lot of controversy about the definition of trauma, but the definition, but the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual defines it as exposure to actual or threatened death, serious injury, or sexual violence. The controversy is that there are many events that may be traumatic, even if they are not life-threatening. We also know that there are many variables that contribute to how someone will be affected by trauma. Variables such as being female, being in either younger or older, as in not middle age, be uh, genetic factors, previous exposure, poverty, and having other psychological disorders all increase the risk of being negatively impacted by a traumatic event. So the three types of trauma quickly are acute trauma, which results from a single incident, um, chronic trauma, which is repeated and prolonged, such as domestic violence or abuse, and complex trauma, which is exposure to varied and multiple traumatic events, often of an invasive and interpersonal nature. So some mix of chronic and uh, acute. So the Center for Disease Control in the United States indicates that about one out of five Americans have been sexually abused as a child, that one out of four have experienced physical abuse, that one third of couples experience violence in their relationship, 
and that a quarter of all children have relatives who misuse alcohol, and that one out of eight experience their mother being physically assaulted. In Canada, the rate of post-traumatic stress syndrome over a lifetime is about 9% of the population, and about 2.5% experience some current symptoms of that in any given month. And over 76% of Canadians have experienced an event that is sufficient enough to cause PTSD. Further, there's a two-year Canadian study that was completed in 2017, and it indicates that just over 44% of the participants who were public safety personnel, so police, fire, EMS, they reported clinically significant symptoms that were consistent with one or more mental disorders, and about 23% showed some symptoms of PTSD. Another report released in 2015 by the Manitoba Nurses Union indicates that one in four participating nurses reported PTSD symptoms. And the same document indicates that 43% of new nurses experience high levels of psychological distress because of their work. Um, so we see some really high statistics in helping professions. So we know that trauma can affect a person mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually, and it impacts memory and concentration. In Nicole's and my work um, with children, we see many that have ADHD diagnoses. And we know that sometimes if we're able to treat the trauma they've experienced, the symptoms of ADHD decrease and in some cases have actually disappeared. Trauma can also be correlated to physical ailments like diabetes or obesity. And we know that it can impact relationships and it can cause difficulty in emotional regulation. So then if we know all of this, should we be screening everybody for trauma? So there's certainly some benefits to screening individuals for trauma. It can assist a practitioner to be aware of any trauma history and perhaps modify or add additional treatment measures. However, it's just as important to ensure that our screening is purposeful. If you're gonna screen, we need to consider what benefit will um, a patient gain? We need to ensure that if we are screening that it only happens once. Having somebody tell their story multiple times can actually cause trauma. So if you're gonna do it, do it once and make it count. Um, we'd also need to ensure that there's supports or resources that we can offer to counteract the trauma if we're gonna ask the questions. We need to also consider that humans are resilient and to ensure a balanced assessment, we may wanna also use a resiliency scale. And then when individuals have a number of resiliency factors, the effects of trauma can actually be reduced and being able to work with an individual's strength is in itself trauma-informed. So we'd also be remiss if we didn't mention the Adverse Childhood Experience Study or ACEs, as it's become a cornerstone assessment tool for trauma-informed care. So many of you might be familiar with or have heard of the 10 question trauma assessment, as I mentioned, ACEs. In 1985, Dr. Vincent Folletti of Kaiser Permanente's Department of Preventative Medicine in San Diego, California, attempted to determine why more than half of the people in his obesity clinic stopped attending, even when the program was proving successful. So through interviewing, he meant to ask a patient, how old were you when you first had sex? But instead, he accidentally asked, how much did you weigh at the time of your first sexual experience? When his patient indicated 40 pounds and disclosed that her first sexual experience was with her father, Dr. Folletti started to consider that there were other factors contributing to obesity, and not long after, the Adverse Childhood Experience Study was initiated. It ended up resulting in 10-question assessment document that's now widely used as the cornerstone of trauma-informed care. Um, if you're interested in finding out your own ACEs score, if you Google ACEs, um, dozens and dozens of tests will come up. They're pretty much um, all quite similar. Um, but the 10 questions fall under three categories of abuse, neglect, and household um, dysfunction. It asks questions such as, were your parents ever separated and divorced? Or did you ever live with anybody who um, was an alcoholic or used street drugs? So one of the um, most important thing though, um, to think about in regards to ACEs is that 
it has been normed for um, Americans who typically are, um, the, the study participants was 17,000 people in San Diego. They all had really good health care. Um, they were all middle class. Most of them were white. Um, when we bring this through to Canada, we know that it was not normed for Indigenous peoples here. Um, if we think about our Indigenous population, many of them would have an ACE score prior to their birth. Um, so again, making sure that we have some resiliency scales and really using this as a tool um, to kind of think things through instead of um, an absolute is, is also important. So why does it matter? Um, Trauma-informed care is open and an open and compassionate practice that all patients deserve because anybody can have a history that may impact the way they interact with the medical system. It can assist with treatment compliance and patient retention as it reduces the risk of re-traumatizing patients and it increases engagement resulting in patients who are more likely to follow through and up on their medical care, participate in long-term care management and be compliant with treatment recommendations. Trauma-informed care also reduces staff turnover because when staff and clients feel empowered, it increases morale and also reduces secondary and vicarious trauma in staff, which ultimately results in less staff turnover. Um, it increases communication between the patient and the patient and the treatment provider, thus decreasing risk, risks associated with um, the client's uh, reactions and presenting problems. It is also an effective risk management tool because it opti optimizes therapeutic outcomes and minimizes adverse experiences of clients and ultimately the organization. <clears throat> the result is better outcomes because patient-centered techniques may encourage more trauma survivors to participate in preventative care. And this often translates into better health outcomes. And finally, because it can improve, because we, it can improve screening and assessment processes, as well as treatment planning, services are often more appropriately matched to clients from the outset. And because clients are more apt to participate in preventative care, it is cost-effective. So there's five main pillars to trauma-informed care. Uh, the first pillar is safety. Um, so under safety um, comes environment. So setting up kind of a calm and neutral space, making sure that there's good lighting, that there's welcoming signage. In, in speaking of signage, we have um, some signs at my work um, and I've always wondered about them. Um, and you, you may see some, you know, in your own work, and I think most of the hospitals here that I've been in have them. Um, the signs say that disrespectful behavior will not be tolerated. Well, I agree um, that we should never really have to deal with any sort of verbal or physical assaults, especially at work. But since the day they went up at my office, I have wondered what kind of message does that actually provide um, as a person first enters a space? And is the sign even effective? I know that when I first started with the government, I worked in income support and we had a glass wall where our clients spoke through this little metal slot and they would pass paperwork, <clears throat> excuse me, through the slot to the um, receptionist, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, we also had an incident in the waiting room almost weekly where we needed to call the police or security. Then we flash forward a year and income support moves in with employment insurance and that barrier, the glass barrier came down and people would enter and speak to a person face to face without the glass and pass them paperwork across a desk. And interestingly enough, when the barrier came down, the incidents decreased to almost zero. It went from at least weekly incidents to one or two per year. So safety is also the need to establish roles and boundaries and make it really clear to everyone who does what and the boundaries of your role. We need to ask, is there anything I can do to make this more comfortable for you? Or better yet, say, how can I make this more comfortable? 
the difference environments and testing can make has been very evident in my home. My daughter has dyslexia and as a result has had a number of psychoeducational assessments throughout her life. She had her first test at home after a good night's sleep where she was comfortable, she had snacks available, she had breaks, and she was not disrupted. In her second test, it was done at, in a room in her school where there were bells going off and kids running down the hall and her friends were waiting for her to come and play. Uh, this in itself resulted in a 30% or a 30 point decrease in her IQ score testing. So the next pillar of trauma-informed care is choice. Um, examples are that individuals need to be presented with all available treatment options, not just the one most recommended, or a choice in how an exam is done. For some who've had trauma, this option will directly impact their ability to feel safe. For example, when appropriate, providing an option to disrobe and put on a gown or instead stay dressed and just lift or move a piece of clothing when needed um, would be optimal. The third tenant is collaboration. And this involves deciding together and involving other professionals as soon as possible so that everybody can work together. And the fourth pillar is trust. So individuals need us to be clear and consistent and transparent in order to trust us. They wanna know what to expect. They wanna know who will provide the treatment, where it will happen, when it will happen. They wanna know if there's gonna be any pain. Something that can help also is offering a mirror for areas that a patient can't see. Um, we can also help by asking things like, is there anything specific that's worrisome to you? By explaining what parts of the body will be touched and by providing ongoing explanation of what's happening and what will happen next and reminding people as we go along. We also build trust when we explain why specific questions are being asked. So for example, instead of asking about income in an assessment, instead advise why this question is relevant to the research and be mindful of the responses you receive as it could mean that there are barriers to research participation. Also pay attention to nonverbal cues that people give you. And if anything seems off, readdress it and ask again, what can I do to make you more comfortable? So the final tenant of trauma-informed care is empowerment. We should work to an individual's strengths and allow that individual to have control where possible. For example, if it's an option, you can let them stop or slow down if needed. Um, we can validate that the individual, or please validate individuals and be careful to not dismiss them. So saying things like, you got nothing to worry about, these kind of messages are actually typically not helpful. Instead, allowing a patient to discuss their concerns and providing them with effective um, active coping techniques are actually more effective than just reassurance that they have nothing to worry about. And I should also note that there are some newer models of trauma-informed care that include um, peer support and self-care. And we'll discuss some of that near the end of our presentation. So how can trauma affect your window of tolerance? The window, window of tolerance is actually a term that was coined by Dr. Dan Siegel. He used it to describe the zone of arousal or the window in which a person is able to function most effectively. So it's the fight, flight, freeze, and fawn reactions that we all know. So when people are within this zone or window, they're typically able to readily receive, process, and integrate information, and otherwise respond to the demands of everyday life without much difficulty. But if we break down the brain into three parts, we have a brain stem that controls things like breathing, the subcortical brain that contains the limbic system or our emotional brain, and then the prefrontal cortex up front here, which controls higher thinking. When an individual experiences a traumatic event or is triggered by the reminder of an event, they can be pushed out of their window of tolerance. And the prefrontal cortex essentially goes offline. And the only thing that starts working or the only thing that's working is the emotional brain and the brain stem. And they are, um, this then results in some difficulty with consequence and actions. So self-regulating behaviors can help put a person back in their windows so that they be, can begin to process more effectively. 
The window as analogy is quite helpful in both psychiatry and social work because the goal is for us to increase the size of a person's window, thereby increasing their ability to cope during stressful circumstances. So when you see someone moving into a state of hyperarousal there at the top, um, their pupils actually dilate. Um, and this is a uh, body's way to let light in to see better. They might have dry mouth. Uh, they might, you might ex see that they're um, breathing quite shallowly. They might experience butterflies in their stomach. Their heartbeat actually increases. They might start sweating. Their muscles are tense uh, because they're ready for action. And when you see somebody in this hypoarousal down at the bottom there, uh, their posture could be slumped. They might have an endless stare with pin-like pupils. Their muscles are loose. They have a slowed heart rate. Uh, their face is blank. But when you're in the window of tolerance, you can actually think clearly and you can be reflective and calm. You can connect with others around them um, and you can problem solve. So as was mentioned, some of the common responses that we might see when someone's experiencing a trauma response are fight, freeze, flight, or fawn. Um, because they're actually physical responses to trauma, if we wanna move somebody from that hypo, hyper arousal state back into their window, there's a few things we can do to help decrease arousal. So something called diaphragmatic breathing, which is deep and slow tummy breathing can help. It also helps if you put your hand on your stomach and feel yourself breathe. Drinking from a straw helps. Jumping on a trampoline, um, using a weighted blanket, drinking warm water, uh, shaking or stomping out any excess energy and soothing and calming music and sounds can help. So that also brings us back to the environment. So thinking about the, the noises in your, in your area. Um, if we're looking to increase arousal, Anything that stimulates the senses, uh, like smelling essential oils, for instance, uh, smell is actually one of the very fastest ways to the thinking brain. Uh, chewing crunchy food, uh, blowing water through a straw or dancing. So essentially we need to respond to their sensory or emotional brain rather than their cognitive brain during this time. So we can help by adjusting the tone, the volume or the cadence of our voice. We can help by adjusting the proximity to the individual, adjusting our posture, adjusting our own breathing. If our body's calm and engaged, it'll actually help co-regulate the individual that we're acting, interacting with. We also can validate their emotions and offer to help them regulate, saying something like, it looks like you're feeling really angry. Would it be helpful if we took a break? I can go get us a drink of water, or we can go for a walk or call someone to support you through this difficult time. We give people a number of options to allow for choice and control. Because if someone's in an activated state, their reactions are often exaggerated. So allowing for choice and control is necessary and helpful. It gives them an opportunity to do what is necessary to help them self-regulate. And then we need to be careful to not engage in behaviors of cause and effect approaches. So statements like, if you do this, then this will happen. Those are actually higher brain function activities, and it'll actually be difficult for someone who's not in their window of tolerance, um, and it could actually result in an escalation of their behavior. Didn't unmute. Um, in all of this, we need to be mindful that our systems are not always as advanced in their trauma-informed practice as we are. It is important for organizations to, it is important, it is important organizations review their policies and procedures and begin to align them with trauma-informed care. But here are a few things you, that, that can cause re-traumatization. Having to continually retell their story for patients being treated as a number or a case, um, procedures that require disrobing, um, being seen as a label, um, no choice in their service or treatment, and no opportunity to give feedback about their experiences with the service delivery. Um, in relationship with an individual, re-traumatization can happen when the in individual feels that 
they, that we have as the practitioner or clinician all of the control and they are not being seen or heard or believed, uh, feel their trust has been violated, sense a lack of collaboration. Um, when we do a thing to, when we do things, when we do things for someone rather than with someone, and when there are practices that are punitive, coercive, or use oppressive language. Um, what matters to parents? We can all make a difference when we consider that, but because of the needs of each family may change, we likely will not be able to give you a definitive answer on this question today. Logically, of course, the risks and outcomes have to be shared with family in families in the name of ethics and informed consent. But what matters is often deeper than that. In our humble opinion, the only way to really connect with a family's experience is to consider the environment, barriers, language, individual strengths, support, culture, and their own and our own self-care. This is um, a video of my son when he was first born, like in the delivery room. Um, and I just, we wanted to highlight what these environments can be like. And it was just accidentally actually taken by my husband in um, when he was just trying to get a picture of our newborn. So um, I'll tell you a story about a phenomenal doctor and researcher. I met this person on this day, the day my son was born, when I was in recovery from an emergency C-section. My son and husband were long gone to the NICU and I was in recovery and my mom was with me. I really didn't have access to my phone as I was on my back and numb from the anesthetic. Then this kind and gentle human entered the room. Uh, he was very gracious and unassuming. So many trauma-informed things were done right by this person. From what I can remember of that time, this memory is a good one and a great example of trauma-informed care in an environment that was less than ideal. This person congratulated me, explained everything, and engaged my mom. I remember commenting to my mom about how kind he was and wanting to say yes to research and anything else that was requested. There was professional mixed with all the humanness that that moment required. However, that person did not and could not know what mattered most to me. Little did that person know, um, that he, sorry, I could tell that the person was trying to make the best of the circumstances and was being so respectful in the process. But little did he know that while I was giving consent to his research study, all I could think of was thank good, goodness they're asking me to do research because that means my newborn survived because I had no idea at that point beyond um, the initial birth. So it's just a good example of how every bit thing can be done right, but unless we ask directly, we don't know what's going on for a patient or an individual or a parent. So prior experiences matter. This is my little boy um, at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and his shirt says, not my first quarantine, which is cute because he was quarantined when he escaped from NICU the first time. And then again, at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, many individuals feel judged or dismissed. And if they have in the past, this can, be in gear, uh, this can be a barrier to engagement now. One mother that I spoke with talked about her experience as a study participant. She said that the re researchers often gravitated towards her partner because he presented as more regulated than she did. 
She felt that her emotional responses prevented researchers from really engaging with her. And even five years later, she finds that they often ask her question, her partner questions, leaving her feeling dismissed. We need diversity at the table when it comes to our patients. Um, we have to ask about barriers and normalize them. We need to be ready with solutions or pre be prepared to seek them. Social injustice can actually cause trauma. Even though there are similarities in the medical histories of the children that we come that come to our attention for research, there is guaranteed to be a great deal of variety in the family's history. These histories cause children and families to experience the same research very differently. If we want to get all the voices at the table, we need to do what we can to eliminate barriers where we can. Socioeconomic status, culture, language of origin, family composition and immigration status, to name a few, can make getting up to appointments difficult. A compounding factor to this is that patients may have prior experiences that, that, that made them feel marginalized in the medical system. And this unfortunately will inevitably Im impact their view of other experiences and potentially research opportunities. Picture a parent who has a full-time job child care for other children, a spouse who can support at home, and a well-maintained vehicle. Now picture a parent who stays at home because of the affordability of child care, whose spouse has, a, has to work all they can to pay the bills, and who travels by bus. Which is, per person is more likely to be able to participate in research? The first step in helping families mitigate these barriers is asking what the barriers might be in support, supportive and individualized conversations. Many parents are likely, are unlikely to offer up these barriers because their prior experience, experiences may have been perceived as judgmental or critical. We should have common solutions up front and be prepared to committing seek, and seeking innovative solutions when needed. For example, parking passes, meal vouchers, snacks, and childcare options may assist. Communication what, communicating what other families have experienced have experienced the same barriers can also help normalize and legitimize the experience of parents. When considering language, we should think about um, translation. Are we able to get the document in a document or provide information in the person's first language? Um, ex explanation should be considered on an individual's level and should avoid medical jar jargon. Consider reviewing material and questions with someone outside of your field to get feedback on the language used. Use care with labels. One parent shared with us that they felt blamed and shamed that their child by their child's delays by the way questions were posed to them. For example, researchers inquired about screen time for their child, leaving them feeling judged in the way the question was posed to them. Use non-stigmatizing labels preferably in, in, in a people first manner. Example, saying a person who is, ex, is ex experiencing homelessness or a person is unhoused rather than they're homeless. Keep in mind labeling individuals as their diagnosis. For example, she's bipolar rather than she has a diagnosis of bipolar. For Krista, she is not ADHD. She has been diagnosed with ADHD. For Krista's daughter, she is not dyslexic, but she does have a diagnosis of dyslexia. Tying this to the pillars of trauma-informed care and connecting it to trust, connection, and empowerment, being mindful of individual preferences is important. You can do this by allowing the individual's language to guide your own. For example, the autism community, in the autism community, there are many people who use person with autism but there has been a movement away from person-centered language and instead saying they are autistic rather than they are a person with autism. This is because it is felt that autism is an integral part of their being and saying that they're a person who has autism uh, it implies that the need to fix it and contributes to further stigmatization. So allow the individuals to, to guide the language. And if you don't, do not know, it's okay to ask. It builds trust to come out and say, would you prefer, how would you prefer to talk about this? 
would you prefer autistic person, person with autism, or is there another way you'd prefer? Um, and if one additional consideration is pronouns, um, ensure that you provide options for more than two genders and that you strive to use appropriate pronouns for an individual. So it's likely important to acknowledge that research can often be very deficit focused. For most of these families, their children will be their biggest hero and they want more than anything to have their journey be celebrated. Research and getting results can bring about the same feelings of uncertainty and fear that occurred when a family first got a diagnosis or when their child was born. Most families involved in medical research for their children have a tumultuous journey behind them before you even come to meet them. It might sound simple, but acknowledging this can really go a long way. These families might be taken by surprise by how triggering conversations about medical research can be. So letting them know that this is a common feeling among parents can help them be prepared for that. And like anyone else, something that brings about unpleasant feelings and is completely voluntary is likely to be avoided so helping them know what to expect will help them participate in your research. There's also a great deal of grief and loss in some of this. Um, so the loss around diagnosis and there can also be um, a great deal of hope though. So my daughter received a dyslexia diagnosis at seven years old. As an avid reader, I was heartbroken that she would likely not know the love of books in the same way that I did. And while her comprehension and language skills were amazing, for a very long time, her level of impairment in reading was so significant that I was actually afraid for her basic safety. I was afraid would she ever be able to read the labels on bottles. I was also terrified she wouldn't get a job or be independent. And I grieved the hopes and dreams I had developed in my own mind before she even took her first breath. Flash forward a number of years, however, and uh, we were on vacation and I look over and she actually has a library book that she's chosen and open and, and reading on her own. Um, so she stuck to it and, and that is one of her strengths, um, acknowledging that uh, she continues to try and try and try. Um, so this is just a little photo that I've added of uh, the first time I caught her reading independently. So many clients are left with a diagnosis or research outcome, but they actually have no idea what to do next for their child. One mother we talked to indicated that the research performed on her son highlighted many concerns for his development, but there is no real support for where she should go next to get supports for her child. She said that she was already lacking in capacity from the medical journey for her child and had to figure out now how to navigate a system that she wasn't familiar with to get supports for her child based on the outcomes of the research that she had agreed to. The powerlessness that many of these families have already experienced is real and not knowing where to turn to can contribute to this. So patients deserve all the information up front. It might be helpful to provide them with information about the effects of trauma, um, doing some psychoeducation with them. This can actually help normalize responses to stressful information that might be provided throughout the research process. Know up front what supports you're actually able to offer them in case it comes up and that you need to offer them. Provide written resources or information. For somebody who's not fully in their window of tolerance when you're talking to them about this stuff, this will be really important for them to be able to review later. Ask them if there's a support person who can attend with them. This can increase their feeling of safety and also help because when an individual is recovering from trauma, they may not hear or experience everything that's said to them at the time. And then provide them with contact information so that they can ask questions later. I'm working on a fidget toy here today which is the picture you see. So if you see me moving around, it's helping me stay in my window of tolerance for this mm -hmm. presentation. <laughs> um, the impact of trauma is often felt first in the body. Uh, it can be extremely difficult for trauma uh, survivors to verbalize their thoughts, feelings, and memories related to their trauma. 
People who have experienced trauma sometimes disconnect from their emotion and physical sensations in an attempt to cope. Hospitals, medical offices, and, clini and clinics are often overstimulating and sterile for good reason, of course. Getting the parent to a less chaotic and more inviting space might make a big difference in their experiences. Obviously, there can, it can be anticipated that there will be a lot of variability in what is possible in this realm, depending on where research is taking place. However, even those initial conversations with parents should be under optimal conditions if possible. This is another good way to ask parents what they need or what make the, might make them more comfortable. Access to food where possible is a good idea. Warm blankets are often offered, offered to patients. And within reason, we would advocate at looking at parents in these situations in the same lens. What will make them feel comfortable, secure, and safe? Most individuals have strategies for self-regulations in high stress situations and flexibility is key. Let parents decide where to sit in the room or if they'd like to stand. It might sound silly, but fidget toys can help people regulate and they are not expensive and they're easy to dis disinfect with COVID. So um, it's also important to consider culture. Cultural differences can exist in the perception and interpretation of the trauma event and also the meaning given to the traumatic event and beliefs about control over the event. So use care and values and beliefs that you hold about health and illness. Um, so for example, some cultures might consider illness as punishment or that some diagnoses might equate to quote unquote bad medicine. Be aware that in some cultures, there are actually distinct roles in decision-making and so that you could actually be addressing a parent who doesn't have the traditional ability to make decisions and that you're seeking that um, um, from the wrong person. Also consider that immigration status could cause fear in some people. So while I spent a considerable amount of my career working with Indigenous peoples, I'm in no way an expert. And given that there's over 600 First Nations in Canada, I could never propose that I know even a fraction of what's necessary to practice in a truly culturally safe environment with Indigenous peoples. But in the spirit of reconciliation, there's many things to consider when working with Indigenous peoples within the medical field. So the first would probably be that while colonization has negatively impact, impacted Indigenous peoples, there's actually over 50 distinct cultural groups within those 600 plus nations. And they represent people who are extraordinarily resilient and they have amazing diverse cultural and spiritual practices despite the negative impacts of colonization. Nevertheless, we should consider that pre-contact, there was very little of any disease. There was no smallpox or measles, mumps, rubella, syphilis, or tuberculosis. We also have to consider that um, we need to consider the implementation of the Indian Act and the control that it still has today. We also need to consider residential schools that was um, put into place as a means to extinguish culture. The last residential school closed in 1996. This means the legacy is that every person in Canada with treaty status and some without either went to residential school or had a parent or grandparent who did. Also Jordan's principle, there was some ongoing dispute over which jurisdiction would pay for treatment for a child and this resulted in the child dying while the federal government and the province continued to fight it out. We should consider Canada's holdout on signing the UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples. In 2007, 144 countries signed the UN uh, Declaration. Only four countries opposed. Those countries were Australia, New Zealand, the United States, and Canada. And it took us until 2016 to actually become a signatory of that document. We would need to consider polio vaccine trials in Goodfish Lake, where it's reported that children received multiple doses that were several times the recommended dose and were knowingly contaminated. Or experimental BCG vaccine trials that were done over 12 years where the vaccine being tested for tuberculosis was given to Cree and Nakota infants in Saskatchewan or nutritional experiments in Manitoba Cree communities and in multiple residential schools, or resi 
um, racially segregated Indian hospitals that um, had a whole range of experimental, surgical, and drug treatments that were administered to Indigenous patients without their consent during the early post-war years. Uh, we should consider the legacy of forced sterilization. In Alberta and in British Columbia, we had laws requiring the forced and coerced sterilization of individuals who were considered mentally defective. And these laws were in place until 1972 and 1973, respectively. Today, there's over 100 Indigenous individuals who are currently part of a class action lawsuit, indicating that this practice likely did not end in the 1970s. We should consider the H1N1 response on reserve where the government of Canada sent body bags to four Manitoba First Nation communities instead of shipments of antivirals or hand sanitizer or flu kits. We should consider Brian Sinclair, who in September 2008 died in the waiting room of the Winnipeg Health Sciences Centre from complications of a treatable bladder infection after being left for 34 hours to just sleep it off. Or Joyce Echequan in Quebec, who died in 2020, after recording racial remarks made by hospital nursing staff. These are all considerations we must have at the forefront when engaging with indigenous peoples in research, in the medical system, or in any system for that matter. While trauma-informed care can reduce re-traumatization and build partnerships that will likely impact your research in a positive way, there's a downside, if we're not careful, that may result in trauma transference onto you. Um, as professionals, we are at risk of PTSD, secondary traumatic response, and vicarious trauma. While these terms are often used interchangeably, changeably, they are different. PTSD requires direct exposure, symptoms beyond 30 days, and a specific diagnosis in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual used by psychiatrists. The term vicarious trauma was coined by Perlman, Perlman and Sackvatin to describe the profound shift in worldview that occurs in helping professionals when they work with individuals who have experienced trauma. Helpers notice that their fundamental beliefs about the world are altered and possibly damaged by repeated exposure to traumatic material. Secondary traumatic response or secondary traumatic stress is a concept that was developed by Beth Stam and Charles Figley and others in the early 1990s when they sought to understand why service providers seem to be exhibiting sim similar um, symptoms to people with uh, PTSD without necessarily having been exposed to trauma themselves. Um, researchers may think that because they are not directly traumatized and th they, then they did not witness the events close up, they should not have adverse reactions. They might also question their entitlement, even feel the way they do. That's a natural human response, but this shame mindset needs to shift in order to effectively manage the mental health impact of vicarious trauma. It is the nature of trauma and how often we are exposed to it that causes vicarious trauma, not some weakness in failure or failure in a researcher or organization. Plainly put, researcher, research participants that are exposed to traumatic stories in, of re, research participants are one of the clearest factors for subsequent vicarious trauma. Related to this, the extent of exposure, how many times the researcher engaged in conversations with the same participant or collective of participant is a determining factor as well. We often hear things like we're just burnt out. We know that burnout is real, but it typically resolves by taking vacation or changing jobs. Vicarious trauma, and secondary trauma, however, does not resolve in the same way and typically requires trauma treatment. So here's some, some of the impacts of um, vicarious trauma and secondary trauma. So like some physical ones would be fatigue, inability to sleep and illness. Um, 
some psychosocial like changes in relationships with family and friends, uh, erosion of trust and self-esteem and uh, feeling out of control in your life. Some of the ways that we can practice self-care is to talk to each other. There are a number of assessment tools like the professional quality of life scale and the impact of event scale you can use to gauge your own traumatic response. Take breaks, develop a self-care plan that includes strategies to reduce the effects of vicarious trauma. Things like meditation, or we have a, professioner, a professor who does clinical therapy and he uses ha a hand-washing ritual between clients in a way to compartmentalize. Use low impact debriefing. So this is low impact debriefing and it comes from the TEND Academy. This, if you wanna look it up, we'll have resources too. Um, because we're so often used to supporting each other, we run the risk of debriefing all over each other. An organization called TEND out of Ontario developed a debriefing process to help remind us that we can be re-traumatizing -traumatiz or re-traumatizing our coworkers. We need to be aware, provide warning, ask consent, and start with disclosing the least traumatic information, keeping in mind that it may not be necessary to share all of the graphic details. So here are our, our children and our reason why. And so also the reason why you need to take care of yourself. Because you need to keep doing this important work that you're doing. So we have a case study now. Um, I think Pierre has a copy that he's able to put in the chat. And our thought was to um, break you up into um, a couple of rooms so that you can discuss this. Um, but I'll maybe read the case study out to you first. Um, so Elena is a 32 year old mother of two children, ages two and four. You are the researcher hoping to gather information about her two year old child who's presented with global developmental delays after experiencing hypoxic ischemia at birth. Elena has missed multiple appointments and is often late for the ones she does attend. She consistently attends with both children and presents as distracted by her four-year-old. Nevertheless, on two occasions, when she's attended alone for an interview, she presented as preoccupied and non-committal. Elena's first language is Portuguese. However, she also speaks Dutch and English fluently. She attended university in Toronto and is advised she has no translation needs. Elena's husband, Jackson, is 37 years old and he works full-time at a manufacturing plant. Jackson has only attended one appointment with the family to date. When you inquired about Jackson's future availability to attend appointments, Elena advises she wish he could come more because he's been very supportive with the children, but he cannot miss work and is unable to leave during his shift as their car broke down, leaving Jackson to commute to the plant just outside of town with coworkers. A nurse in your current practice remembers Elena and Jackson from their time in the NICU. She's told you that Jackson was very attentive to Elena and the baby and was able to support Elena through hard conversations that were had after the birth of the baby. When you discuss the birth of her two-year-old, she's often teary and on one occasion, she abruptly left mid-appointment without explanation. Elena's in your practice today and it's imperative that she present for weekly appointments over the next six weeks and your concern that her lack of engagement may result in further missed appointments and a loss of study data. So what trauma-informed practice principles, remembering the pillars of safety, choice, collaboration, trust, and empowerment, can you use to work with Elena? So we're just looking for some examples um, in regards to this case study, things that you think that you can do that, um, that would help. Here, I think a lot of people had to step out for other meetings as we anticipated. So maybe we can just have this, the answers to this thrown in the chat. I think that might be advisable at this point. 
Yeah, I think that, that's perfect, Nicole. Um, I was going to actually suggest the same. So yeah, if anyone wants to feel free to jump in, um, we can certainly chat about it a bit more and, or, and, uh, and explore the case study. I can share um, the, the other document, or at least even if you can want to reread it real quick, um, you can just follow that Google document link that was shared in the chat. Um, but if it makes it easier, of course, we can pull it up and, and share as, as well and uh, open up the floor for any thoughts to be shared. Daniel, go ahead. Yeah. Um, hi, I'm uh, Dan Goldowitz uh, from Vancouver, as the picture indicates. And, um, you know, the, the thing, I'm a researcher at, the, at UBC, and the thing that uh, tugged at, <laughs> at, at my mind in a, in a bad sort of way was the presentation, in the case presentation, the researcher was worried about their own research, being able to finish the research, as opposed to the well-being of the child and the family. And that... <laughs> <laughs> that, that had me worried that they had a very different focus than what it, it should be. Um, so I'm not, I just thought I'd share that. <laughs> and uh, maybe I missed something in the presentation of the case, but uh, that, that was very worrisome. I'm wondering further to that, Daniel, do you have any ideas on how they could turn that around or things that they could do to, to focus more on um, Elena and her two-year-old? Oh, yeah, so, um, you know, clearly this is a, a, a pediatric condition uh, that was exacerbated at birth. And, you know, maybe to bring in a clinician, if that's okay with Elena, uh, for discussion, although I, I, you know, there is this issue, I guess, of, of getting engaged. Uh, but that would be my, my first thought. I hope that wouldn't be intrusive, but I think that would be important. I think that's a great idea. And like when we think about trauma-informed care, um, like you mentioned, um, you were wondering if that was okay. And I think asking Elena if that would be helpful to her would, would certainly be, um, would be great. Another tidbit in there that we put in on purpose was that um, this nurse seems to have had a good relationship, the nurse that's now in the clinic um, with Elena in the hospital. So maybe bringing in someone that had been, has who has a supportive history with Elena and her family. Um, and then maybe also considering ways to engage Jackson a bit more, maybe like with some innovative ideas such as like, virtually because she talks about him and how she needs him for this sort of thing, so. Yeah, yeah, good points. Um, yeah, you know, on one hand, uh, getting uh, intrusiveness uh, could actually make the situation more complex is my, my worry. But, you know, something to offer support uh, for Jackson in terms of travel to and from work or something like that uh, could be, you know, could be helpful in this regard. Awesome. Anybody else have any ideas on things that we could do to support the family? Kent has a hand up. Sure. Go ahead, Kent. Kent, you might be on mute. Yeah, you're on mute, Kent. Yeah. How about now? There we there we go. Yeah. Perfect. There we go. Okay. I, I was just saying thank you, Dan, because I was hoping if you just talked enough, you might get to the point of what what I was hoping somebody would say. Um, around this case, I'm uh, aware of the opportunity to ask uh, for any specific ways, because I didn't hear them so much in the presentation, but are there specific ways that 
trauma-informed care is different in pediatric practice than in the general population. Not that we ever, you know, outgrow a need for comfort care and consideration, but uh, uh, I, I wonder if you have any specific uh, tips that way. Yeah. Well, we should I can maybe provide. Oh, sorry. Were you asking Daniel or or? No, no. I was I was asking the presenters. Oh, okay. okay. Go ahead, please. I actually could maybe give an example that, strangely enough, came up in my house yesterday. I was talking to my daughter about um, her dyslexia diagnosis, and what she actually said to me was that, um, and and she's nineteen now, so um, she also has ADHD. Um, I had thought that we had done a pretty good job of explaining this to her and and um, through the years. And um, she said, no, nobody really explained this to me. And I said, no, sure they did. When, when we had psychologists sitting down with you, they went over things with you on, on what would work best for you. And I was trying to remind her of some examples when the psychologist talked to her about like where to hold a calculator so that it runs through her brain properly and stuff. And she said, no, 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 those are all strategies. No one ever explained to me how my brain works. And, um, you know, she's 19 and the first time I heard that was yesterday. So it kind of brought me to think, um, I think with, with children, not dismissing them, making sure that uh, we don't kind of talk over them and that we may have to explain to them. Um, so at 19 years old, she's kind of said, I still am kind of learning every day and no one, no medical professional, no psychologist, no psychiatrist has ever really sat down and explained these things to her. Um, so that would be one of the the differences that I would say is just be really careful that we're we're reminding or that we're mindful of like who the patient is. Um, so often in very little ones, we would have to talk, you know, to the parents, but also being quite clear that um, um, the patient's actually the child. So in in whichever way possible, we would want to involve them um, in their own diagnosis, I guess. Yeah, I think it's very interesting to consider those kinds of strategic workarounds, but they should never supersede a basic understanding of what a child's condition is, particularly in an age-appropriate way to be able to explain it to other people in their social circle and experience. For sure. For sure. Uh, as a parent of a younger child who's been recently involved in lots of um lots of research things um i'd say practical things like like little like really short time like book book your day um and like food um but i also think like making it a positive experience because kids like won't go back and they also won't um like give you a true representation of what's happening for them or what their capabilities are if you were not um, kind of tapping into their basic needs. It's like that hierarchy of needs, right? And I would also say like children tend to be, especially in these realms, like a, a direct sort of mirror of their parents' experience of the, this. So um, the more comfortable the parent is, and I'm not dismissing the needs of the child, but it really is like a huge consideration because um like I I thought about research and and the, and the work that had been done before my baby was even born knowing he was going to be like a micro preemie and need lots of support and intervention and I knew that the parents who had gone before me um are, are were the sort of pioneers that had allowed the doctors and researchers that were dealing with my child at the time to have the information they needed to give him the best possible chances at life. So um, also tapping into that with parents in a, like a non, um, with like without pressure. I don't, I'm losing my words now, but. That's okay, thanks very much. any other comments or questions or contributions to the case study?
I know in Calgary where um, Nicole works at a child advocacy center and um, at the children's hospital here, they have some options um, when parents in this situation come in. Um, we're lucky enough to have some childcare options. So like in the case study, Elena is often kind of preoccupied with the four-year-old and it makes it really tough to focus on, on the two-year-old, which is the reason um, why she's there. Um, so perhaps um, seeing if there's any options for someone to, to attend to the four-year-old so that she can do that. I think one of the other things we, um, Nicole and I were talking about is that, um, you know, it, we're not sure how many vehicles these people have. Um, she said that her husband now has to commute to work. If she's the only person um, who can care for these children during the day, her husband has to work and their car's broken down, if that's the only car, um, that might be your one big barrier in regards to her showing up to these appointments. So, um, you know, asking and addressing um, if there's anything that you can do in order to assist her to get to the appointment and talking through that um, might actually get her there every week if we did something as simple as giving her a taxi chit in order to, to show up. We also, oh, sorry. Uh, I, I was, I was just going to, please don't let me stop you from offering anything valuable you have, but I, the, the, what, um, what Krista had just mentioned uh, sparks my mind to think about, particularly, uh, you know, during the era of the pandemic, uh, how has, uh, you know, virtual care or various uh, digital health tools imp informed or improved the uh, outreach? for trauma-informed care approaches? That's probably an entire area of study. And I think for somebody like this, it, it might actually make it a little bit easier for her, assuming that she has good internet and a computer, um, but it also has its challenges with the, the lack of face-to-face -face and not necessarily seeing the, um, being able to see somebody's um, like whole body and the reactions, um, it makes it a, a little bit tougher for somebody to be able to tell whether or not maybe somebody's, you know, shallow breathing or whether their pupils are dilated or whether they seem um, like they're they're distracted because you're not really sure what's going on in their house or where they're at. So I think that's um, you you bring up a good point Kent, that uh, that there's a lot of things to consider in regards to the virtual care model. I have something of a reputation. Sorry, I was just going to say I have something of a reputation for suggesting topics that could be another presentation of their own. So uh, take note, Pierre, please. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Uh, I think as well. Um, like I know at the I volunteer at the neonatal follow up clinic in Calgary at the Children's Hospital here, and um, like a lot of research all but halted during especially the earlier part, and then there was a lot of digital things happening. But I think, um, yeah, I mean we were just figuring out the digital pieces, and like Krista said, there's some advantages because it does uh, allow for some like people to be more reachable, but like children will not do research on a camera, like I would say. Um, like Krista said at the Child Advocacy Center I work at, we have a whole room of toys that kids kind of get to like have a peek at and know that they're gonna get to pick something out at the end of whatever we need to do with them that day. There's a like a whole play room where they kind of hang out with their parents before they go in. Um, we have blankets, we have uh, coping kits with things like this and little toys to let them just sort of hold. And we have dogs there too. So for chatting with kids. So there's, um, there's all kinds of things that are missing in this virtual world that we're hopefully heading out of. But um, yeah, it's a good question and really interesting topic. And I have lots of feelings about it. So Uh, so any additional thoughts from, from the group? I just have one more request. I wonder if the pre presenters would be willing to share any other resources on uh, trauma-informed care uh, curriculum that they might be aware of. 
uh, thanks for bringing up that that point, Kent. Um, um, and, and Nicole and Krista have provided some references um, that inform the presentation, so we'll certainly make that available um, uh, in a, in a moment in the chat box. But we'll also send it out to all of the attendees. Uh, but uh, any other comments, Krista or or Nicole? No, our references do have a few. Um, there's um, University of Buffalo, their social work department does have quite a bit of information on trauma-informed um, care um, and kind of quite a few infographics um, that I can think of. Um, the National Institute, well, the National Brain Institute, I think in the United States also has a pretty good trauma-informed um, care section on their, their website. Um, and I think a couple of the resources that we have in our um, references might um, might um, link to a few places. Nicole, can you think of anything in particular? Um, the place where you got the the window of tolerance was that the National Brain Institute? Uh, N I B a it's national institute i know dan siegel and um vessel van der Kolk and all of those guys do stuff there so we can we can have a little chat after krista and pass the information on too so we can be more articulate in our answer to this question krista you're muted Still muted. I think your earpods right. kicked you out. Uh, the National Institutes for the Clinical Application of Behavioral Medicine, so NICABM, they have a huge website with tons of information on there. That helps. That site is like run by the pioneers of trauma and trauma psychoeducation and um, trauma informed practice. So, yes, yeah, so that's a lot to, to dive into. Um, did um, I don't have any other comments or questions for, for Krista and Nicole? I was wondering, did you want to switch to the last uh, word we had for our key take home messages or? Mm. I see. Thank you, Daniel. I see you've put something up in the in the chat there. Thanks for that. I'm just going to say that this group at the University of Florida are, are very active in trauma informed care. Yeah, so if you wanted to, to navigate back to that, uh, that, that uh, mentee mutual link we had earlier, there's a second prompt now um, that um, pulls off, I guess, from the uh, case study you all just uh, uh, explored, but um, contextualizes a bit more to your specific uh, situation. So yeah, uh, I should maybe help if I share my screen again. Um, but you know, essentially, the prompt is uh, asking you like, what, uh, what elements of the trauma-informed practice uh, can you consider adding in in, in your specific context uh, that would help um, uh, actualize some of these core principles? Awesome. Looks like we have people are going to ask what they can do and break down barriers and build relationships and provide support and increase their communication. Yeah, so I think those are all great starting points to uh, get the needle moving on, on that and, and informing your, your practices a bit more.
So with that said, oh, but how if I copy the link and share it with you? One moment. Uh, so with all that, I just wanted to thank uh, you all for joining us today as, as Nicole and Krista introduced to us these, these essential tenets of, of trauma-informed care uh, that, um, as you can see, you can easily work into, start working into, uh, into the context of your specific uh, clinic, uh, clinical um, research uh, work that you do. Uh, and of course, a special thanks uh, to, to both Krista and Nicole for, for joining us today and sharing uh, with us their wealth of, of knowledge and, and expertise. Um, and as Kent had already provided us some feedback, we'll take note of, of how we suggested topic for a future session, um, but uh, it, it included in the link and, and, and through the QR code presented on your screen, uh, there is a post session survey that we uh, request you, you fill out. Uh, as this gives us a bit of a sense of, of what you liked about the session uh, and uh, as we mentioned, uh, give you an opportunity to uh, suggest any future topics that, that we should consider exploring uh, in this series. Um, so we will certainly follow up with a, a debrief note. We'll link to uh, those references, provide you a copy of the uh, presentation. Um, and uh, yeah, when it, with Krista and Nicole provides us with some additional feedback for uh, potential uh, training curricula or training materials relevant to trauma-informed practice, but we'll certainly collate that and uh, send it along as well. So again, thank you so much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your week. Uh, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again.